Hello and welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to address a bunch of things that I keep seeing with my Instagram peeps that are building their own prosthetics. First off, let me say, it is so cool to see all of the progress that is being made on every one of your projects. And I'm so glad that I've been able to guide and inspire you as you design and eventually finish building yourself a device that will hopefully end up changing your life for the better. You guys are all doing such incredible work and I'm so proud of you for taking the steps to pull yourselves up, to embrace your suck, and decide to change your circumstances by investing the time and energy necessary to build yourself a prosthetic hand so you can get back to living your life more closely to the way that you used to. That being said, I see a bunch of you running into the same issue. And while I love the individual interaction that I have with each one of you, hopefully by making this video, I'll be able to help everyone at the same time so I can spend a little less time answering the same questions over and over individually. What I've been seeing on multiple builds lately is where you guys have the primary and secondary axis of the gimbal backwards. 99% of the function of the hand is going to be in opening and closing the fingers, with splaying the fingers making up a very small amount of the usable function. Splaying the fingers, while incredibly cool, is actually more of an aesthetic than a function. Don't get me wrong, I love it, and I found it to be very functional in my day to day. But for you, you need to decide for yourself if the aesthetic of the fingers being able to splay is going to be worth all of the extra work that is going to go into fabricating your device. Either way you go, the components of the primary axis need to be super robust since most of the input is translated through them. While the mechanism that controls the splay can be really lightweight since splaying the fingers takes about zero input force. Speaking of force, Unless you can physically curl like 500 pounds with your residual limb, your device is going to need to employ some form of mechanical advantage by using assemblies made up of links and levers. Now the thing with the levers is the longer the distance from the fulcrum to the end of the lever where you're applying the force, the more mechanical advantage you end up with, but at the cost of needing to move the end of the lever proportionately further. What I'm seeing is that everybody is overly concerned about keeping the device super tight to the back of the hand and wrist. And while having a nice compact design is great, it shouldn't be at the cost of making it physically more difficult to operate through desired range of motion. Making the device smaller by shortening the throw of the lever components ultimately decreases the amount of grip strength that you can expect out of the device. Think of it like a fire triangle. You have the amount of physical force that you're able to input to the device, the degrees of travel that you have to move your hand, and the mechanical advantage of the design of the fingers. This, divided by friction, will equal the total amount of grip force that you can expect out of the prosthetic. If you put 50 pounds of force with a short travel in, you aren't going to get more force than that out of the fingers, without making either the travel of the fingers shorter, or the increase of the input travel longer. It's all about how much force you can manage to get out to the fingertips without losing it to friction and mechanical loss. Everything is subtractive. Sorry to say, there's no magical strength multiplying fairy that's going to make it so you can crush the souls of your enemies. A simplified way of thinking about this is input force times degree of travel divided by length of the lever has to equal output force times the degree of travel of the finger divided by the length of the finger then divided by the number of the fingers and then multiplied by the mechanical inefficiency. But that's probably something that we can discuss at a different video if there's enough interest. For now, Let's start at looking at the basic geometry of the hand, so you can decide what's going to be most important for you in your build. With the mechanical prosthetic that I've been working on, the fingers will articulate with only the abduction and adduction of the wrist, the splay of the fingers being accomplished by the lateral motion of the hand. To get started, let's look at the parts that make up the hand. In my construction, I have a base component that everything mounts to, and also mounts to the side of the socket. This base is what the gimbal attaches to. Also mounted to the base is the base reversing lever, so aptly named because it's a lever that reverses the direction of the input and it's mounted to the base. Connecting the gimbal to the reversing lever is the reversing link. It's important to make this link very stout because there's a lot of force that's getting transferred through this piece. Speaking of force, tension is always better than compression when transferring loads from one component to another. This assembly is how we get from the rotational motion of the wrist to the linear motion required to actuate the fingers. From the base, we turn 90 degrees across the top of the hand to the top reversing lever. This lever is used to reverse the direction of the output again, as well as change the ratio of the linear motion 
from what is available out of the base assembly to the amount of linear motion required to fully articulate the fingers. The end of this lever is connected to a swivel to allow for differences in the alignment throughout the sweep of the lever. From there, we get to the first stage of the whiffle tree. Here the load is divided to two equal lengths to power both the index and middle and ring and pinky. Next is a pair of swivels to allow for adjacent fingers to be at different positions and still be able to grip. The whiffle tree allows for equal pressure to be applied through all four fingers to an object even if the object isn't cylindrical. So now that we have an idea of how the motion of the wrist drives the fingers, let's get started calculating the geometry that we'll end up using to determine the lengths of the levers and links. When planning out your prosthetic, start by measuring the available range of motion of the wrist, from flexion to extended, parallel with the inside of the forearm. If you're going to forego incorporating splay into the design, your build will be much simpler, and you'll be able to get away with using a gaffney joint rather than a gimbal. A gaffney is an orbital joint similar to a heim joint. It allows for rotation along a major axis, as well as a small amount of lateral motion to accommodate for any misalignment of the forearm cuff and the socket throughout the travel, while maintaining a fixed distance between the cuff and the socket. However, if you're set on building something like my hand, you're going to need a gimbal so that you can isolate the abduction-adduction motion from the lateral motion of the wrist and drive the two functions independently. The major axis used to open and close the fingers and the minor axis used to swing the metacarpal bases and in turn splay the fingers. With either design option, you need to start by laying out the base since everything is connected to that. Of course, the very first component that you need is the socket, but I'm going to assume that you already have that either completed or at least underway. The base gives you the fulcrum the point that all the compression side of the driving force rotates through. So start with three points on the side of the socket to form an isosceles triangle. You want the points to line up on the side of the socket in more than not a flat plane to make mounting the base assembly easier. Be sure that the base of the triangle has a decent amount of height so the fulcrum is firmly affixed in relation to the socket. It's important that the fulcrum is lined up with the anatomical center of your wrist or else the forearm cuff is going to chafe your arm as you open and close your fingers. Now that we have the placement of the fulcrum, let's figure out what your range of motion is. The major axis endpoints I use for my device is from as far back as you can comfortably move your hand to where the palm is about straight in line with your forearm. Basically, from flexion to where the muscles of your forearm just start to pooch out. I use 38 degrees as my reference number from flexion to extension, but your mileage will vary. Once you figure out your available degrees of input, you'll need to figure out the points of the front triangle. From the fulcrum, measure to the palm side of your residual limb, back just a little bit from where your amputation occurs. That point marks the hypotenuse of the front triangle. Next, go to the bony structure where all the metacarpals join at the base of the hand, specifically the trapezoid and capitate bones. This point gives you both the base and the height of the front triangle. While we're looking at the front triangle, let's take a look at the length of the arm on the gimbal. The longer the distance from the fulcrum to where the reversing link connects, the more degrees that the reversing lever is going to rotate, and with that, more linear distance that is available to articulate the fingers. That increased linear distance is going to require more input force from the wrist. You can partly counter that by moving the forearm cuff further from the fulcrum, but don't move the cuff so far that it rests on the muscle. Instead, position the cuff just in front of where the muscle begins. That way you don't end up bruising the muscle. That point gives you the base of the rear triangle. Next, let's figure out the height of the rear triangle. Take your front triangle and draw a circle that originates from the fulcrum and intersects the height of the front triangle. Now draw a line perpendicular to the base of the rear triangle and add 3 eighths of an inch or so to where the circle intersects the perpendicular line. The reason for that is when you open up your hand, the last thing you want to do is pinch the skin on the back of your hand between the inside of the gimbal and the top of the socket. You'll make that mistake once, and it's a real attention getter when you do. So now take the rear triangle and rotate it to 38 degrees towards the front, just to make sure that the top of the gimbal doesn't intersect with the top of the socket. That gets us both the triangles. Next, we need to look at the requirements of the fingers, or whatever you're planning on driving. With the fingers of my current hand, the chain is connected to the distal and travels through the proximal and medial segments of the fingers. The chain needs to be drawn an inch and a half in order to fully close the finger. 
So we need to go from 38 degrees of motion at the wrist to an inch and a half of linear travel at the top of the hand. We have two reversing levers that's lengths can be manipulated in order to get to that final ratio. The reversing lever on the side and the one on the top. Really, they can be set up any way that space allows. If you can only get a portion of the linear travel from the lever on the side, then you need to make up the rest with the one on top. The important thing is that you end up with enough travel, plus just a little bit extra to accommodate the accumulated stack error in the design, or throughout the fabricating process. It really doesn't matter how you get there, just be sure to add a little bit extra travel. Next, let's look at the whiffle tree assembly. Accuracy is super important when laying out this assembly. Being off just the slightest amount is going to make it to where the fingers don't open and close at even rates. So keep that in mind. The whiffle tree is a balance beam. If both sides aren't exactly the same length from center to center, then the fingers will end up closing at different times. I employ that feature primarily on the pinky. The pinky linkage is the shortest. Not by much, only a couple thousandths, but it is slightly shorter. This is so that it closes first when the hand cycles. I have the hand set up like this, so when I pick up and hold a glass, that the cup posts on the side of the pinky, keeping it in place, while the other fingers just hold the glass against the palm. It also helps with the lifelike appearance of the hand. With the natural hand, you don't usually close all the fingers at the same time. You kind of fan them. And where I've been able to do that with my prosthetic, it really adds to the natural appearance of the motion of the device. That's where I'm going to end this video. I'll address the components related to the display function in a later video. I'd like to thank everyone that has chosen to back me on Patreon. I really appreciate the support that all of you give me. You guys are absolutely awesome. I'd also like to thank everyone that has taken the time to leave a comment in the comment section. Everyone is always super positive and supportive. I keep saying it, but I really do have the best subscribers in the whole of YouTube. As always, please remember to like, subscribe, and share my videos. And of course, be sure to leave a comment in the comment section. Thanks for watching.